All right. So we're here to talk about PBL, project-based learning. Um, this was something that I started doing back when I taught high school. Um, my high school principal was really interested in the idea of PBL, and he went out and found a, a group of trainers who train faculty and K-12 instructors on how to implement PBL in their classes. Um, and it's something that I've it's always stuck with me. It's something that I liked doing um, with my, you know, 10th grade, 11th grade high school students. Um, I incorporated it into my practice when I was um, continuing on and uh, started being a faculty developer, um, helping people incorporate aspects of PBL in their practice. But I'm going to rely pretty heavily on um, the resources that I got from them and that they continue to push out into the world. Um, their name is called the Buck Institute for Project-Based Learning, Buck being spelled B-U-C-K. And that's um, the infographic that we're looking at right here um, of what project-based learning could be. This is the Buck Institute's um, design and layout. That is not to say that there's not other layouts or um, people that help you do project-based learning. Um, it's just this is their method, and I really like it. And I think that people who are on the call who already incorporate some projects into their own learning will see aspects of this in their own practice, things that you've already done, you know, by intuiting, things that you've already done as kind of like second nature um, as part of what you're doing. So I just took the information out of the infographic so we could be able to talk about it, um, uh, be able to read it a little bit more easily. Um, the thing about PBL, the thing about product-based learning, and it's a really a mindset shift, or at least it was for me, is I think I thought about like when I thought about how I teach, if I was going to do a project for a unit or for a chapter or for a small piece of my um, class, I often taught it the same way. I would start and I would do my lectures, I would do my test, and then, okay, now we're going to do a project about this. What the Buck Institute really forced me to really think about is how do we make it so that the project is the learning, not the project comes after the learning? How do we integrate the project from day one so that you present the students with that question, so that you invite them in to do this work with you, and then continue them through this process? Um, and it's all got to come from the central learning objectives of your course. If you're not, not focused on some kind of key knowledge, some deep understanding, some kind of success skill, I, I, I think PBL is really going to really going to fail. What you need to make a real PBL course is something that is driving the entire project. And I've got some examples of this. Um, that I'm excited to share because um, I think that will help conceptualize that framework. So, you know, when it's number three on the list that says sustained inquiry, but it's not number three in importance. The idea that you are going to do this throughout the entire class or entire segment of your class is going to be devoted to this and not just like after you've taught the content, now they apply it, but how do you build building block assignments throughout there? And, you know, they really challenged us to think about not contrived problems, but real authentic problems, real problems that, you know, anybody um, could see and do. Um, so I'm going to go on and start talking about some of the milestones in a typical project based course. I'm going to give all the, I'm going to give some examples, then we'll come back to these like key characteristics one more time so we can continue to think about those. Because I think it's really hard to do it in the abstract. So one of their suggestions was start with a kickoff event. Start with an event that builds the rest of the challenge. Um, one of the things that I've done um, and I've seen done very effectively is inviting someone in to outline a larger problem. 
inviting someone outside of your class, outside of the institution to come in and be do that like guest lecture hit spot, help outline a problem. And then the students can start to think about this big problem or this thing that they need to do and move through the process of designing a solution or designing a project that outlines um, what they're going to be doing um, through that. When we switch to PBL and you've got this big project that you're doing over a long period of time, um, it becomes really important to put benchmarks throughout the entire project to here are when little things are due. Here's when a piece is due. Here's where you're showing this competency here that you're going to be doing in a later project. And I, I think that this will start to make more sense when I go through and, and start talking about the example. And then because this is a project where we want students to really continue to iterate on the idea, you've got to build in the time for critique revision and reflection so they can keep making it better. Because that's one of the things we don't always do so well in higher education is continue to iterate on something that you did. A lot of times it's you submit the paper, I received the grade, I moved on to the next thing. What they're trying to get us to do with the PBL is I did it, I received feedback, I improved it based on the feedback I received to make it better for version 2.0 and version 3.0. So that that I, that opportunity is in multiple opportunities for critique, revision and reflection is really, you know, um, really important. And then they want to have a final product. And just like you had that kickoff of them, they want to have that final project be public and celebrated. So let's look at um, a case study. This is a class that I worked with in the past it was a business innovation course at Wells College, which was the institution that I came from um, before SUNY Oneonta. OK, so number one aspect of PBL, we have to come from a key knowledge, understanding or success skills. So the instructor pinpointed what they wanted to do. The key knowledge for this innovation course was the design thinking model. It's a model that was uh, built by Stanford University, and um, they spun off into their own group that they called IDEO. And what he wanted the students to know was how the design thinking model works and run through a practice of using the design thinking model to create something new. This was his key understanding for the whole class. This is what he really wanted them to know. There were other smaller things, just like the other smaller learning objectives and anything, but this was the central thing. This was the most important thing. So he started to build this project um, built around these ideas of the design thinking process of if I was to challenge my students to design a project or I mean, sorry, to design a product that they could sell. Remember, these are business students. What would the design process look like? Let's build that through the entire semester and and um, and, and do that together in this safe collaborative space. So to make it really authentic and to make it um, kind of an event for these students, he invited in a local plastics company um, that he was able to, they presented a challenge to our students. They said, hey, here are some products that we make. And you know what? We would really love to make some products that are, are sellable either in the automotive industry or in the pet industry. These are two industries that we're not part of already. We would love to see what you could come up with to modify our existing products but to make them, um, but to make them uh, sellable into some new, um, new markets for us. So that was our big challenge. It's not the only challenge, you know. And we can spend some time thinking about what what might our challenge look like for different disciplines. We've got a different challenge coming up um, where Chilton's going to take over a little bit and talk about 
um, a different project that he and I both worked on. Um, so, but th this is authentic for them because they're business students. They've got a s project coming from a business standpoint, and they're saying like, how do we work our way into a new market? Okay. So again, I said that there was always going to be like more learnings that would go on inside this. It's not just like this is a one learning objective course, but we started to think about these and say, okay, you know, design thinking is really a, a skill all in itself. And we're gonna devote class time to, to learning and understanding this design thinking. And then another skill is gonna be some of these softer skills, these 21st century, you know, learnings and skills. Hey, I think somebody just walked into my um, into my apartment. I'm gonna just turn my camera off for a second. Uh, Chilton, can you riff for a second? Uh. <laughs> Um, so Alejandro, I was looking at your your question about the the empathy stage, and just went, was wondering if you would um, want to expand on that for a second while we're while we're waiting. What what were you what were you thinking in that question? So in the in the previous slide, be, um, Ed was showing that that the first stage of this project based learning is the empathy stage, and I was wondering because Ed said that you, a, a great idea to 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 do this is through a kickoff event and through the kickoff event, maybe have a, a guest speaker say this is going on. So I wonder if that empathy, it's called empathy because it's the acknowledgement that there is a problem or, some, or something real. So a real connection. We're not going to create something just for the heck of it or we're going to, you know, do this project and come up with ultimately something that's going to help answer a question or you yeah, know, does that make sense? No, you know, in, in a lot of ways, there are um, strong correlations between the design thinking model and the project based learning model. But what that what I was showing you on that slide was actually what we were trying to teach the students. It was this is not the um, project based learning model. This is the design thinking model. Oh, so this I is see. the key knowledge he was trying to teach the students. But in a lot of ways, the design thinking model and the project-based learning model are mirrors of each other. They're both iterative processes that ask us to approach a question from a certain way, define it, come up with solutions, dig into it, dig into it with our um, you know, foundational academic disciplines, and then come up with something that represents that journey. Okay. So, though in a lot of ways, the I, the design thinking model is similar to the project based learning model. It's just this through project based learning. This is what he was trying to teach. Okay, I get it. Okay. And and I, just to jump in real quick with that, I do think that that idea of empathy, though, what they were saying there, and I think is important for project based, is that it's part of that motivation. We want you to get into this. The think about why is this important. We want you to have some connection to it and that's that's what they're getting at from that but i think is also important in project-based learning as well mm -hmm. and, and and the way the pbl model looks at this the way the buck institute works at this is authenticity and i think what you're keying in on is there's many ways to be authentic and one of them can be empathy and relating to an individual a way could be a real world problem that you're trying to solve or work with Authenticity could be real community engagement that's happening through your class and with your class. There's a lot of ways that we can build that authenticity into a course. It's just how are we going to choose to do that? So for this course, and this is like one of the big challenges of PBL. And, and in this course, this is where the instructor came to me because he had built this design studio at the college and he said to me how are we going to teach students to design things in 3d that help us fulfill the learning goals of this course but don't overtake them right a lot of times when you talk about project-based learning you're adding in a lot of other learnings into your into your course so I put three tools up on the board here, and this these are these tools were all available at the time. Um, Tinkercad, Autodesk, and Fusion 360. They were all part of the Autodesk suite, 
in their 3D CAD programs, their design programs to build objects. And I put them on the, the slide here in order of complexity. Tinkercad is uh, named after Tinker Toys. Um, it's really easy to use. Fusion 360 is what the actual engineers were using. And so what we had to do um, as part of this was really analyze the tools and analyze our learning goals to make sure that they matched. I could teach a student how to use Fusion 360, but I would need a couple of weeks of class time. It's possible, but if we don't want to use, you know, um, if we don't want to devote two weeks of class time to learning how to use CAD, then we need to find a simpler tool. So there's a lot of matchmaking in there. And we actually ended up using the most simple of the tools that were there. We ended up using Tinkercad. And the way Tinkercad works, you know, uh, quite honestly, is you drag and drop different blocks and shapes together, and you can end up building a 3D model or a 3D image um, because of that. And that was easy enough. Um, and that was my role in this class, is finding technology that was easy enough for the students to use, that they felt like they were doing something really cool and really special while at the same time not overtaking the 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 content learning objectives that they were doing so um you know it was just a blast seeing these students present in halfway through the semester um where they were going with their projects um so courier came out to see us a total of three times to kick off the project. They visited our class um, in the basement of our building that we were in um, to check in halfway through where we were to present to them our project. They gave us real feedback. This wasn't like our instructor just you know, giving feedback. Well, I wonder, I imagine people in the industry would want. Um, it was somebody really coming in and giving us some of, some of those uh, hard truths about what we were doing and how we were doing it. And then we said, okay, we'll see you later. We'll see you in six more weeks. Wait till you see what we come up with. And so that was really interesting to see and watch because these students were continuing to ideate and continuing to build over time. Now, this was a crazy idea. Um, the One of the products that Courier makes was injection blow molded um, fertilizer spreaders. You know where you like hook on a hose onto a onto a hose and you just spray your lawn and it both waters your lawn and fertilizes it at the same time? Well, they had given us the challenge of we want to get into the pet market. So we started to say, like, you know what? What if we made a dog shampooer that was the same idea? And so this 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 um, team started to use the design thinking process to try to build something that could work and be used to you know deliver shampoo and water <laughs> to our dog um, that was uh, we had a, we had a volunteer. So that's actually the dean of the school's dog that we borrowed for this uh, prototype testing session. Uh, <laughs> And uh, uh, one of the feedback we got from the dog was the water was a little cold. Um, <laughs> but this was our students' learning process as they learned um, as they learned this model. It was real world. It was applicable to them. It was interacting with people they might want to work with in the future. They were meeting business leaders in our own community. Um, and, and that was just so much fun for them. Um, I, you know, I got to see some of these students in a lot of classes and they tried so hard their effort they put into this class um was uh was incredible this this next one um this was this was a, a an idea and it was for medicated lotions medicated lotions because the lotions were so expensive sometimes you didn't want to waste it and so the idea was, you know, 
the student was so funny. They would go, you ever like, you know, you're in the shower and you're trying to get the last bit of shampoo out of the, the bottle and you're doing the tomahawk right there, like trying to get the last bit out. And she's like, we don't want to do that with medicated things because, you know, we're getting a prescription. It's expensive. It's wasteful not to get every last bit out. What if we made a bottle that had a trap door? And so you use it the standard way for 99% of the time. But when you get down to that last little bit, you're able to unscrew off the bottom and be able to get to that last little cup worth of, um, of medicated lotion so that we don't waste any. And this was, this was her business idea. And you can see she went through like several different you know, iterations of it. Um, she created, um, you know, she found out that it was better when you had coarse, um, what is it called? The things that grip onto a bottle when you put it on? Threads. Thank you. She yeah. found that coarse threads were better than these thin little threads she put on at the very beginning. Um, then she found out that it really made a mess of everything if you didn't have a cup below that that would like catch everything in there you know so she was she, like what was the learning objective for this that we wanted to teach them design thinking we wanted to teach them the idea that you're going to continue to iterate across a thing and this was a very effective way to do that um if i go back to the 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 um picture of courier checking in i don't know if you can see in the background um our entire classroom was just whiteboards Every wall was a whiteboard. So if you look past the courier, you know, people and, and, and what design thinking has, it has a series of structures that you need to work through and a series of like organizational guides that we teach the students. And it was that process that was really important. But they were participating in the process as they learned about the process, which was really fun to watch and, and see. So. I'm not in this picture because I was taking the picture. That's that's always that's always the the uh, what happens. The person has to take the picture is they don't they don't get to be part of it. But that's our students there um, meeting with our community partners from Courier and uh, and seeing what happens there. Chilton, are you ready to take over? Sure. Um. <clears throat> So this is um, a project that we worked on over last summer um, called the Global Commons, where um, we wanted to have students be able to have an international experience that weren't traveling abroad. So the focus at first was how do we have a, an international experience for our students? And in this case, um, we wanted it to be around some type of service project that they were going to be doing. And so, again, when we're going back to this idea of project-based learning, that was the goal of this, is we wanted them to have an experience where they were not just going somewhere and traveling, but we're actually going to be working with somebody to create something meaningful for them. Um, and so, um, in the planning of that, we talked about a lot of different iterations and came up with this idea of having students work with um, non-governmental organizations, NGOs from around the world in different places, to be able to help them come up with products that they would need for their local communities. Um, so the idea here was that they would be meeting regularly with their uh, not a, a representative from that NGO. They would hear what that company or that group or organization needed, and then they would be working together inside of their groups to be able to help them out. Um, and, and so that was the start of this. So um, we had these three different pillars of what we were talking about that we wanted to really focus on with this. One was we wanted to be project based. We wanted them to have that service learning portion of it. We wanted them to have an international experience. Um, and so that was the second portion of it. And then the third portion of it was we whatever they created, we wanted it to be openly licensed so that whatever the students created could actually be used by those organizations. So we were very upfront with students about that. This is exactly what you're going to be doing. Um, and here's how we're going to do that. So we were because it was an intercultural experience, we wanted to make sure that students had some understanding of what it means to tell a story for another culture. Um, this isn't just going into a local organization down the street where you know everything. You're actually going into somebody else's culture. And so we wanted to have, make sure they were aware of that as a process. Um, so we um, had students go through some content 
around intercultural storytelling to begin with, um, just to kind of give them the, the, the idea that when you go in to talk to your NGO partner, you will have better questions to ask them and a better understanding of what it means to talk through with them. Once we did that, then they actually started to meet with their um, NGO client um, or partner um, and really start to hear what it was that they needed. Um, there was one group that wanted to have some COVID information. They wanted to have sheets to be able to hand out to local residents in Kenya about what how can you prevent things from happening, uh, getting COVID. So they were really looking at having some informational stuff to give to the local residents. Um, there was one about a, um, a, a reserve that was called the Bracken, Brackenhurst Forest, um, where they really want to get out some information about their, um, the, how that um, area had been started, how they were continuing to work with it, just kind of give some good information to people to be able to share with this. Um, so, yeah, in this case, we, we chose five or six different ones because the other part of what we wanted them to work with, what are called the Sustainable Development Goals. These are United Nations um, goals on how do we um, develop things in a sustainable way that will be good for everybody around the world. There's 17 of these goals. We chose five of them to be the focus of this course. We actually had five different courses running simultaneously. Each partner was lined up with a specific sustainable development goal. So that was the framework that we wanted them to use, as Ed's saying in the chat right now. Um, that was the framework that we wanted them to be able to look at this. It wasn't just about um, them being able to, to go in and help, but we wanted them to think about, okay, for the Friends of Brackenhurst Forest, you're going to be looking at this from a climate action perspective. How can we make sure that um, what we are saying is also saying how it shows and highlights how they are being good for um, the climate and what they're doing. And in this case, they were re reforesting an area that had been deforested. So they really wanted to focus on this reforestation process and how that was good for the climate. Um, so they wanted to look at all of these perspectives, how to have intercultural storytelling, how to be able to um, look at this through the, we call them lenses, through the lens of a, spe a specific sustainable development goal, and then help out this um, non-governmental organization. So we had them we, we had them meet about halfway through the process, and this goes back to, uh, this was some of the reflection we did afterwards, and goes back to what Ed was talking about. We didn't make it iterative enough. We wanted, they're, they're planning on doing it again this summer, and this summer, they're actually going to have them meet with their NGO partners very from the very beginning. So they have an idea of what they want, and that becomes the basis for everything else that they do afterwards. Um, so we realized after we did this one, we actually needed to realign things so that that project did become central to everything that they did. Um, and that was some of the feedback we got from the students is we had them look at intercultural storytelling through some different um, mediums. They could either do graphic novels. They could do uh, journalists. Um, they could do um, podcasting, and they had chosen that before they had met their NGO partners. So now we're going to say, okay, you can meet your NGO partners earlier so that you can think about that when you are going through all of this different content. And again, to go back to what I was talking about, this then becomes that that project becomes part of the whole narrative throughout the semester. Um, we did have them meet regularly with their um, partners so that they could get feedback on that. Um, and then at the end of the process, they actually presented their their work, their final um, project to the group that was openly licensed. So then those groups could take those projects and be able to actually use them immediately inside of their um, inside of their organization. So the next slide I think Ed, you were going to was um, we we actually collected a lot of these. We have a website which I'll share the link to where you can see all of the different projects that were created. Um, in this case. Um, they were, uh, this group wanted to be able to have a pamphlet that they could um, hand out for the National Resource Center for Children with Dis Disabilities um, and be able to have a pamphlet that they had in their office that they could share with others as they came in to talk about some of the different things they had available inside um, of this local resource. Um, thanks, Ed. So Ed just put the link into the, the chat. Um, to be able to, so you can go look at some of the, if, if you hover over projects at the top and there's a whole, all of the projects from the whole uh, Global Commons session were inside of that. Uh, we've collected them all. Um, so it was such a great project for the students because this was a, a very much a project-based um, service project that they were doing where they were doing a service for another group um, to be able to help out somebody. So there was 
um, both the in, the intercultural perspective on this as well as the um, creating the project for the group, which really brought a lot of great reflections out of this after the fact. Right. So on the last, well, on the last slide, slide, I just said, I just is said, this is gold standard? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. spoiler alert, yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> so I think now, you know, I was trying to present these things as abstract at first, but I think the 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 examples really help you understand what we mean by gold standard PBL. So if we're looking at that SUNY Global Commons, what is the key knowledge, understanding, or success skills? that we're trying to teach these students. We're trying to teach about the SDGs themselves, those sustainable development goals from the UN. We're trying to give them an international experience where they can talk to people from a different culture. And we're trying to teach them about storytelling. Those are the three real pillars of this course. And how did we achieve that? We achieved all those key skills through a project. The, the our, our partners, you know, gave us, gave our students the challenge. Here's what we need. We need to communicate to a larger audience. How can you help us? How can you tell our story? And so that challenge helps, you know, solidify this. And they're going to work on it throughout their entire course. It's not just like tacked on at the end. They start thinking about it. And then as we pick things for them to read as we pick their, you know, course activities. It's all building towards this. So, you know, Chilton didn't talk about it a lot, but, you know, we built a whole set of readings for the course um, that were like, hey, how do you look at climate change from a sociological perspective? How do you look at, I mean, this is how we're tying in the content, but we're still, it's not that we're taking out content of the course, we're making sure the content relates to this challenge in a way um authenticity since it's all real world it's it just feels very authentic for the students it's not like a contrived example um the students got some choice in there about what they were going to do they got to pick which sdg they wanted to work on and they also got to pick the format they were going to do um I, I hope chilton shows you some examples um he can pull them up right now while i'm talking and then he can kick me off the screen share when when i'm when i'm ready um you know we had a one student who did a beautiful watercolors and put it together as a graphic novel to help the brackenhurst forest group tell their story other students were creating pamphlets that actually could be distributed now it was important to us because we're kind of open advocates we're kind of open uh nutzos Everything was with a Creative Commons license, which meant we were giving the organization permission to use our exact pamphlet the way we designed it, or also to continue to iterate upon it and use it in the future or pieces of it in the future. They could keep building off of what our students started, which is just an awesome way to you know share and give back to the community as you learn. And I thought that was really, really excellent. And then we built in moments for um, reflection and revision for the students so that they could keep thinking about, okay, this is how it's working. This is how it's going. How am I gonna do this better? How can I really deliver for this group that you know wants and needs my help? And then, you know, sometimes this gets overlooked, but the public product really helps students do their best work. When they know it's going to be seen beyond their instructor, who they tend to feel very safe with, when they feel it's going to be seen beyond their class, they tend to feel very safe with, but like, oh, we're going to have a show. For SUNY, we did a Zoom call where um, we invited people from across. The SUNY provost came in on it. The students were all showing off their work, not just for each other, not just, you know, you know, I used to do in high school, like the gallery walk assignment where we'd show the class each other's work. We weren't just doing a gallery walk for ourselves. We were inviting everyone to come and look at this. So, you know, that's that's a little pressure to put out your best work when you do something like that. And And, and so this is how these eight standards of you know, um, gold standard PBL kind of fit together when we talk about project based learning. Chilton, you want to show off some examples? Yes, I can I can steal I can steal your sharing. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> 
So um, just to give you a couple ideas, here's the one that Ed mentioned first. This was a watercolor. So this was a, a somebody did the graphic novel um, and was um, wanted to be able to give this in a in a very visual format. And so they um, went through and pulled out information from them and just put along these nice, beautiful watercolors um, to be able to, to kind of give that, um, to fill out the story on the Brackenhurst Forest. So it was a really neat way that this uh, this uh, group did this and worked together to be able to put this this out for them. Um, and a, and a, all of the, the watercolors are... Um, original they didn't pull it from anywhere else they actually um, used them as a part of this so that was one um this was the um pamphlet that they were handing out in uh, that they made for um a group in nigeria um, about COVID 19 and so they actually have this as a pdf where you could put this on the front and the back um, and be able to give out um, as a pamphlet and be able to put in different places um the other one i was going to show was this this would be the last one i'll show just as an idea um this one uh was a group that was for um in jordan this place called guara asafi um and was talking about it as a, a tourism destination and looking at how they were looking at sustainable development was one of their um tourism was sustainable development was their sdg and so they were kind of looking at um what that can look like and so they went through a whole um oh yeah they went through and, and created a whole presentation that the group could the um, company could use to be able to show off and highlight some of the um great things that are going on in that area um, to be able to bring more people in and share it with um and uh, the feedback from you know what was neat was we did a, at the end of this when we actually did a presentation where everybody got together from all the ngos and all the students and, and did a big reveal. They'd already revealed to their individual NGO, but did a big reveal so everybody could see everybody else's projects. And there was just lots of positive feedback on both sides of just how that worked together to make it not just a um, project, but how this fits into the culture that it came from. And so there was just lots of great feedback on that. Yeah, and you know, the two examples that we show, really the project took over the entire class. Um, but I think there's aspects of this that we can think about that are smaller and maybe more attainable to start, start you know, at, at the beginning. Getting. And the example I want to bring out is that, that it happened in the biology department. The biology department wanted to rewrite all of their freshman labs um, to be a little bit different. And one of the things that they did is they started saying, you know what, all our lab class we give our students some very contrived situations to teach them very specific skills. You know, we have to teach our students about titration. We have to teach, there's very specific skills you teach in a bio one lab. And they said, wouldn't it be nice if our labs felt like they were building to something? And so what they did is they built, instead of having, you know, 12 independent labs, that you did over the course of the semester, they started to do four labs where you got an authentic problem, you got a real scientific problem, and you could work through all of the steps of an experiment. And they would just teach you the skills that you needed as you needed them to do this experiment. Instead of like, you know, some of these like kind of high schooly or contrived labs that are like, hey, we're gonna figure out the pH of this vinegar, you know? actually do a project that, that where determining the pH is actually important and then build that into a larger lab. Um, and so I think that, you know, even if you don't take the entire, you know, seven characteristics of gold standard BBL, I think there's still some things in there that you can um, take in and bring into your practice because I think they're all good. Um, I've seen them do a lot of, of, of um, motivational work. When you work with the students because because when you when you make it real for them it, it does give them a different mindset and that's all i had to share that's what i wanted to start a discussion about that's what i want to talk about you know the, the, the one other thing i'll throw in there that, that excites me um, is this could also be something that becomes interdisciplinary Right. We can we can think about this from I think about it from a coil perspective when you're thinking about working with another with another group from somewhere around the world of uh, having a project as the basis for that. But it could also be where um, you are working with um, a graphic 
designer on our campus or a graphic design course on our campus to be able to create something for your course where your students create the content for it and their students create the visualization of it. Um, there can be some real great ways of doing interdisciplinary work that can be around this. It can um, be really cool. Yeah, yeah. And the last thing I will share is I, in my music class, I teach a, a, a theory class and music theory is not the funnest thing in the world. So I actually have them, my, this is a very small version of project based learning, but I have them actually create um, songs. They take a nursery rhyme and throughout the semester they actually work on it that we uh, throughout the semester we say we're going to do this um one thing i just learned recently that, that i'm thinking about doing is and, and julie i don't know if you know about this but in the music department they have when when somebody calls the music department they have uh, music that goes on when they're put on hold and they're always looking for different music to be able to, to use when you're on hold and so um we were i had i can't remember who i was talking about about i could actually have my students submit their music to be hold music for the music department so I'm thinking about just to make it even more applied and more applicable, like that'd be a cool way to be, hey, if you do good enough, this could become hold music. So congratulations. So. <laughs> but no, um, I mean, you really think about it. I mean, um, we have instructors who are looking for assignments, you know, all the time. And um, what could you create that would be a uh, truly interdisciplinary assignment that would meet all of their learning needs, but also, um, you know, help you do something. That that that, that could be really cool. Um, Alejandro's here looking and staring at me. And uh, the thing that pops in my head is we have a class that one of their assignments is creating book covers. You know, one of our graphic design classes makes book covers. She just built had a whole semester where she had students build a original book, her own form of project based learning. This past an authentic semester? assignment that will be used, you know, and and what if we could, you know, build that bridge between the two courses and be like, hey, we need a cover for this book. Let's we let's do. turn that into a competition. We've got a lot of instructors who are building a lot of learning resources themselves. We have illustration classes. We have all kinds of things. Now, you got to be careful because this is these are you know these disciplines are not here just to serve us right they've got their own things you know that the, the going on but if you found the right instructor it could be a really fun collaborative project um built throughout the semester By the way, the person that let themselves into my apartment is uh, the, the refrigerator repair person. So, you know, I'm not like, you know, about to be murdered or anything. <laughs> so I was, I, the door open. I thought that was important. <laughs> <laughs> I am curious if anybody else does things that they consider, uh, as you think about this, are, are there things that you do? You're like, oh, that sounds like project-based learning or, oh, that strikes this where I'd love to do something in this area. Anything that comes to mind for you as you're thinking through this? I, I have in the past um, done a, a project for my students that I think it was almost project-based learning. I just did the project at the end of the semester in a way for students to apply what they learned. Um, this was a, a an advanced translation course that I taught. And uh, usually in the past, I used to give projects to the student here. This is a text. Pretend I'm the client, so you you translate the text and then you submit everything to me. But then when I decided to incorporate um, the experiential learning thing, I actually look for real clients in the Anianta community. So I went to Catholic Charities, I went to Anianta Public Transit, and actually they were they were our main client. We had four projects for Anianta Public Transit, and so telling the student or my students that listen what you're going to translate for this class is not going to be just for me so i can give you a grade you're going to see it on the bus that you ride every single friday night to go to main street so and and that's what they saw that they saw the rules um against discrimination that that drivers could not discriminate any passengers so my students translated that and they can see that on the bus and on the bus stop so that really made I think that really made a difference because they saw it as a real job. So mm -hmm. they were not going to get paid for it. They were going to get a grade, but they saw it as a real job. So that real life connection uh, was really nice. So I think that has 
a lot of potential to become project-based learning. Um, I think I could re, you know, tweak it and implement it from the beginning of the semester and have students work a little bit at a time and have the clients, number one, for the kickoff event, come to the class and say, this is what we need. This is our problem. We need this from you. And then at the end, students could just present their final projects to their clients. So I think that that just tweaking it a little bit that that makes it a project based learning, I believe. That's what I that, that's what I really think is is we do so much of this just because we intuit it as as instructors as teachers. But like each of these components that 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 uh, the buckets to put in their model, and it's just a model, and it's only as good as any model you know can be. But I think that they do have good things in there that you're like you know what I used to do projects all the time, but I didn't celebrate them enough. Mm -hmm. I really miss that final event where we got to show off what the students did that was what i was missing in my practice mm -hmm. you know is like that final event where we where we work with the communications department or you know, not not our not our faculty department but the suny oniana communications and say here's what my students did and this is how they're benefiting the oniana community you know so they have that press release so that people know about what happens on our campus that kind of thing that's that's what i was not as good about incorporating and what i would want to do more of in the future kim go ahead I've, I've often done, you know, projects of some sort, but at the end, right, at, you know, they're due at the end and they're, um, you know, and sometimes I'll sign them early and we try to work on them, but I've never integrated it as much. And it's something that I've wanted to do and you know, that I wanted to do. In particular, we're looking at adding a senior capstone type of class in which it really is project-based learning. And I really like that idea of a kickoff event and then really integrating it. And then, you know, so that project becomes really the focus of the class and all the learning that comes from it, um, you know, based based on that. So I this has been helpful um, and I'm looking forward to try, trying it in the future. <laughs> Julie, you look like you were going to speak. Or you're just showing her, showing her your, your face. I just want you to see my face in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it's one of the things that I've been thinking about of how is higher education going to be different after COVID. And I really wonder if it's going to be easier to invite guest speakers in and be easier to ask for that. Hey, could you give me 30 minutes of your time twice? three times throughout the semester. We'll bring you in via Teams right to my class. We'll have that kickoff event. We'll have, you know, you come in and see the mid-semester presentations, and then we'll see you one last time. Because, you know, um, we worked really hard with the Wells one, particularly, not to ask too much of our courier, you know, partners. Mm -hmm. We traveled to them two out of the three times they only came to our campus once because we were we, we were we were asking a lot from them and they were our willing partners but we were afraid to you know um damage that relationship by asking too much but now when you can you know people are more familiar with these video conferencing tools it might be easier you mm -hmm. know it might be easier to um to invite someone in to give that you know pose that big problem that you're trying to solve or that what what is what is our what is our um set for the whole semester this is a this is a question i have because artists um want each other to come into their classes and give feedback and and introduce things and uh yeah i can exchange with one other person if we can get it to align but to just be continually asking the people I know to give me two hours of their time without compensating them makes me really uncomfortable. So really making sure that they are getting something out of it, I think, is is mm -hmm. important. And I, I've struggled with this when inviting artists because artists are always asked to do things for free. Mm -hmm. And so I don't. Yeah. So I, I haven't. Yeah, that's that's an issue for me. That's I don't know how to work it out. And that's why I like this the project based version of this, because in this case, they, they should be getting something out of it, right? Like you're making something for them. So it is worthwhile for them to give you the feedback to be able to say this is why we need this so that when they get what they want, they, they, they can be something that's useful for them. 
So when the sign is hung on the bus, it actually says what it's supposed to say and doesn't say something completely different that people are laughing at who actually speak Spanish when they get on the bus, right? <laughs> yeah, it also speaks to the network. You know, the, the network might need to be bigger so you're not always tapping the same people too many times. Um, you know, and, and so if it was something we were really serious about as an institution, you know, it would be like reaching out to the alumni office. Who's, who, who is the people that are in the field that are working and doing and, and have a connection with this place that might be willing to give? And how can we spread that out so it's not always the same people that we're asking? And what can we give them in recognition when they do these things for us? You know, I, I, I joked about, you know, the college releasing the press release um when when the students work was done but what about the press release when they come back giving back to their alma mater that says something that they can put on their professional you know portfolios and put in put into their digital online presences yeah i was invited back to all my my alma mater to 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 work with their students and and things like that how do you cultivate the, that relationship in two ways mm -hmm. i know that's such a big part of coil chilton is making sure that both parties get benefit from the interaction so i imagine you have a bunch more ideas than i do well, and what I would immediately thought of, like you were just going to alumni center, but I was like, we have an, we now have an applied learning center, right? Don't we, we have a right? So like that that'd be a great place for them to work closely, maybe with alumni or other places to be able to say, let's have it'd be great to have one place on our campus where you could go and be like, I would love to have somebody be able to come in and read this goes to kind of what you were talking to about where we have areas of expertise across campus that could even do it on our campus, be able to have somebody come in. And so to have some of those networks and that networking so that we're yeah, not relying on the same people all the time. Um, is really, I, I think it's going to be really important if you want to do this. I used to always get invited to judge the business competition at Wells. I loved it. The <laughs> business competition. I would go in there and the, all the kids would be all dressed up and they'd present their business plan and everything. I had a blast doing that. And so, you know, there is an, an internal network and an external network that you would be really be looking to draw from. Um, and I think that also can help with not burning any one, you know, collaborator out you know, too much. Alejandro, do you want to add something in? Yeah, I have a weird question and let's see who can answer it, if it's answerable. <laughs> uh, what kind of relationship do you see between project-based learning and open pedagogy? The reason why I ask this is because this semester, the, this spring semester, I had an open pedagogy project where my students and I wrote an OER book. So I thought initially what I was doing was a project based learning because I was the client with the need and I was the person evaluating that at the same time. But it turned out to be more open pedagogy than project based. So is there a connection? Can there be a connection between these two things? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. The only difference is now you've you've licensed what you're putting out into the world openly. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I'm one of the people that I, I like, I love open pedagogy, but I like to be critical of it as well. And I like to ask people, you know, not just because you're putting an open license, that open stamp on a project, does it mean that the project has value beyond mm -hmm. the student's own learning? And if the answer is yes, that's when I love it. If it's the same paper they would have always written and then they license it CC BY, Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's good that you taught them about the licensing there, but, you know, I, 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 I think that's less cool. But when you have the, the, the project itself is meaningful and has purpose, it wasn't just to teach them. It was also for mm, a wider audience to be also to for something else. That's when I think that um, product-based learning really goes well with that idea of open pedagogy. You know, and, you know, I, I, I'm always thinking about you and your big project where you did it as a textbook. And I was always wondering, like, what could I do to help out with that a little bit more or a little bit better? And that's why I keep doing favors for SUNY Press. You know, SUNY Press keeps coming to me and asking me for favors. And I'm doing a lot of favors for free right now for SUNY Press. And someday I'd like to be back, go back to them and say, you know what? 
I have this class that's making a buck. I would just love for them to have a meeting halfway through the semester with a real content editor to really look at the book with their eyes and help the students understand what a professional in the field looks for as they create a text. Mm -hmm. You know, beyond, you know, Ed, who's just interested in it and does it, you know, for the love of it, the definition of amateur. Um, <laughs> Um, the, but also having like a peer review opportunity, right? So asking yeah. someone from another campus to actually take a look at the book that we wrote this semester, that would also give it an extra layer. That would be the next step, right, Ed? Yeah, I mean, it's, so that's it just well, these little things that we could do to help motivate our students. And also, when we motivate them, also elevate the project that we're doing a little bit. You know, that's the things I think about. Um, and I don't look down at anybody that has five out of the seven characteristics that are in this model. Because if you've got three out of seven characteristics, you're you're doing a great job. You know, it's just this model is just meant to give you things to think about. It's not absolute. These people aren't gods. It, but it's just things to think about as you do your planning. And, and that's what I appreciate. Like, I, you know, as Kim, as you were saying, like, you do a project and like, oh, how can I make this better? It's nice to have a model be like, oh, I have one, two and three. Oh, yeah, I don't have the celebration. Oh, yeah, I could do embed it further into the class. Um, and, and so it's like uh, you you start we start from all sorts of different places. And so in this case, like it, you, it's a good place just to review and say, how can I expand this or make this better? And that's why that's what I really appreciate about that. Yeah, models are great when they're useful and when they're not, we throw them out and pick a different one. So Ed, you were saying that from the standards, so I, I also have that thing here. I have it here in front of me. So so it, I have seven here. So as long as you use, you don't have to use all of them, right? For a project to be PBL, right? You can you can have some components of it, right? If it's got a, if it's a project and the students are doing it, it's by definition PBL. It's just, oh. this is their, you know, this one institution, the Buck Institution, this is their model of PBL. Okay, I thought it was like a cake recipe that you needed all the ingredients to have it. Okay, okay. No, it just tastes best if you got all the ingredients. Okay, okay, like a ceviche, <laughs> an amateur ceviche that you can We can still call it a cake. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Hey, we went five minutes over, um, but I hope that it was a good conversation. This is, you know, I always say that my favorite thing to do is just talk about teaching. So I'll stick around if you want to stick around. Otherwise, I want to be respectful of your time.